so I've read three books recently that I enjoyed enough that I would love to give them spoiler reviews. Um, Something Wicked This Way Comes, Night of the Mannequins, and uh, Weird Sisters. So expect reviews for each of those. Um, this is the one I'm doing first because honestly it's just the one I'm the most excited about. <laughs> Even though it's probably the one that the fewest people will watch. But you know, oh well, I want to talk about it. So here I am. Please be patient with me with the others. They are, they are coming. So Night of the Mannequins really, really took me by surprise. I read um, Mapping the Interior by Stephen Graham Jones last year and it made it to my top books of the year last year. And I've been wanting to read more of his stuff, but I just haven't made it a priority. And then my friend Jimmy from the Fantasy Network was going to read this, and I said, me too. (laughs) So we read it together, and it was the perfect book for us to read together, because this book is riddled with clues about what's going on. And in the end, it doesn't actually just say, it doesn't overtly say, okay, here's what happened. You kind of, but all the clues are there to let you put it together. And we had so much fun throughout reading this book. We had so much fun trying to find all the clues and trying to piece it together. So I read this and I uh, vlogged reading it in my 24 hours of horror video on the other channel, which I would recommend. I had a lot of fun making that video um, and I just became obsessed with it. So I finished it, loved it, and then turned around and immediately started reading it again. So I've read this twice now and I'm just really excited to talk to you about it. So um, again, the the 24 hours of horror video, it was spoiler free. This is a spoiler review. So I am going to be digging into all the clues and talk to you about like, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to find Carol. I'm going to tell you what I found. So um, this follows a group of best friends, five kids who are best friends and they're kind of like their own family. Uh, in the eyes of Sawyer, our protagonist, they are their own family. They are his family. And they are in their sophomore summer. Soon they're gonna grow up, they're gonna go off to college, life's gonna be different. And it really fixates on that fear of being left behind. And that is manifest through Manny, the mannequin. Um, So this group of friends one year found Manny and he um, became their companion for the summer. They carried him around everywhere. They took him and had him do a bunch of pranks and uh, then they forgot about him, moved on. And now Sawyer is, has this fear of being forgotten and being left behind by his friends when they all grow up and, you know, expand their lives as adults. And he really projects onto Manny. So what I loved about this book is that it was a really interesting story. This mannequin that this group of friends fell in love with, or rather that, you know, took in and he became a part of their shenanigans and then they just kind of forgot about him and then had one more prank the prank to rule them all and then Manny just got up and walked away and then started hunting them down trying to pick them off and then um, our main character Sawyer takes it on himself to pick them off himself in order to protect their families and it's, then it becomes this really twisted story where Sawyer kind of becomes, not kind of, Sawyer becomes the villain of the story. And it's kind of this question of like, where did this shift happen? Was Manny ever even doing this? And how did Shauna, <laughs> how did she make it to the end? Um, so what I loved about this book is that it is a really interesting story, but it's not just that. There are clues everywhere in this book, it seems like nearly every single line was pointing us in the direction, but you don't realize it because it's woven into the story. So it just feels like plot, but it's like, no, that's not just plot. That's not just a kid telling his story to you, leading us to the conclusion that we're ultimately going to get to. So there are a lot of clues that at the very beginning of the book that Sawyer is an unreliable narrator. um, And we start as early as chapter two when the prank is happening and they're at the movie theater and when they have Manny there they've 
taken him apart and put him in his seat and then the manager is called and the lights go low and when the lights go low Sawyer gets really disoriented he describes feeling like his seat gets picked up off the ground and is floating on the ground over the ground and all the other seats are also doing that and they're all getting mixed up and then they set back down and he can't like he can't keep things straight anymore and then he has to fixate on the exit sign in order to be able to stay somewhat grounded so when Manny isn't caught and the manager moves on to him he already kind of starts to spiral this is right after the manager asks for Manny's ticket and then moves on and the prank doesn't work uh, Sawyer's response is if this prank wasn't working then then nothing held up right nothing was real everything was cut loose and falling just wherever it didn't matter because rules didn't count anymore and then in the middle of me forgetting how to breathe how to process how to not run shrieking away into permanent crazy land the assistant manager got to me to check my ticket so just the idea that this prank wasn't working just the idea that something went wrong made him completely spiral it like it was the beginning of him saying nothing's real then nothing's right if this isn't right then there is no reality so all already he's kind of like everything is sort of anchored to this moment we also get several clues in the way he talks about his mom for instance when um he is talking about manny and he's talking about what happened um i think it's tim that says what do you think einstein and he says it was what they've been calling me since i started ap courses which my mom said would calm me down keep my brain keep my brain clicking on other stuff instead of obsessing about all the wrong stuff and then having to recount it for whoever would listen. Okay, so that's our first big indicator that there's something deeper going on with Sawyer and that he's been struggling with overly hyper fixating on the wrong things and then needing to recount it. And this whole story is him recounting what happened to us. So that's our first indicator that it's Sawyer the whole time. And then a couple pages later, he starts fixating on the movie and on Shauna after Shauna dies, dies um, on Shauna that she was probably watching a bootleg version of their superhero movie. Um, and then he says, mom's right. I always do make things more complicated, see motivations and agendas where there's not really much of anything. Another indicator that this is a pattern for him kind of projecting and fixating and creating his own realities. And the thing with Sawyer, Sawyer is that he really views this friendship group as his, re as his only family. They're everything to him. When talking about Manny, he says, you would think that we would remember him. He was our friend for the summer, but we just dropped him. We just abandoned him. And then he goes into an explanation about how friends grow apart. And that's just kind of the way things are. This is the pattern of things. The way they treated Manny is the pat pattern of things. And then later on, he talks about his own family by saying, you might wonder what uh, when he's talking about why he wants to kill his friends in order to protect the families, he says, you might wonder why that's what I'm all the defender of, why I care about family so much, being a teenager and all, who's only supposed to want to get away from his family. But do I really need to explain it? It's not that my mom and dad almost split when I was in the sixth grade. My dad skidding off on the Kawasaki, my mom cooking everything in the pantry and then throwing it all away, which I guess was the year we found Manny too. And it's not because Shauna had to go to therapy during third period for two years because her dad left. It's because of math. A family is usually two or three or four, five people. And each of us was only one person. Five friends all together, yeah? We counted as much as family for sure if you look at it like that. So he talks about how his family was going through a really big rough patch at the same time that they found Manny. And he talks about his own family kind of being individuals and that his, his family doesn't make a sum of a family, but that his family is all individual people that just happen to live together. That's the way he speaks of his family. And then he speaks of his friendship his friend group as if they're his real family but then he t also talks about the natural progression progression of friend groups like what he's in and that natural progression is that they're gonna grow apart and they're gonna break up so he essentially has this extreme fear of what they did to manny which is not a big deal because it was a mannequin happening to him he's gonna be the one that's left behind he's gonna be the one that's forgotten even though they've lived life together 
I'll give you another example. When Manny first walks out of the theater, he's freaking out and everybody else is pretty comfortable with it. But he tells them, no, I'm telling you, Manny did get up and walk away. And in fact, there have been signs that he's doing this all along. And he talks about how Manny got on his dad's Kawasaki and Kawasaki. Yeah, I think that's right. On his dad's motorcycle. And uh, nobody put him there. He didn't put him there. His mom didn't put him there. She's freaked out by the mannequin. His dad didn't do it. His dad views his motorcycle as sacred. He wouldn't mess with it. It wouldn't be a joke. And the friends are like, come on. No, one of you guys did it. And he's like, no, I'm telling you, none of us did it. Manny got on that motorcycle by himself. This is not a game. Manny's moving. So he's like really intense about it. And then just a couple of chapters later, he admits that he was lying the whole time. He talks about his mom's miracle grow and how uh, she uses it as sort of like a cheat to make her lawn look better than it really naturally should. He said, that's all lying about Manny on the motorcycle was miracle grow to get this idea to bloom up in Danielle and JR's heads faster. And it had still been a joke anyway, right? So he tells them, no, Manny is sentient. I have signs to prove it. And then just a few chapters later admits, okay, so I was lying about that, but that lie is nothing but just, it's miracle grow, just like what my mom does to her garden. But what happens to Manny later on in the story, he supposedly starts stealing miracle grow from people's sheds and gets to be this giant figure and uh, becomes this like looming threat that could potentially kill everyone if he doesn't go pick off his friends. That's all Manny was though, just a lie, just miracle grow. But it just keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger in his head. Then we can also point to something that happened just the chapter before he calls Manny, before he equates Manny, the lie about Manny to miracle grow. Just the chapter before he says, you're growing, aren't you? I said to the idea of Manny, the idea of him nodded back. He was hungry, he was growing and he sort of remembered us. The idea of Manny. He's talking to the idea of Manny in his head and saying to, and the idea of Manny is responding to him and the, and, and the idea of Manny, what he's saying to it is you're growing. The chapter before he equates the lie about Manny being sentient to miracle grow which then becomes the conduit of how Manny grows to be so large in the story, right? So we have, this is like, we're not even to the halfway point of the book and we have a myriad of clues that this is all in Sawyer's head that Manny never got up and left that theater. Also, there was the clue about the, the fact that Shauna, when she died, when the Mack truck hit her house and killed her and the entire family, supposedly, um, and Sawyer says that there was never a funeral for Shauna because um, her whole family died in that accident, so there was nobody to come. There was no family to come to the funeral. Plus, they didn't have a body, so there was nothing to bury. One, funerals for people without bodies is a common occurrence, or with a funerals with people with unrecovered bodies is a common occurrence. But two, Sawyer's Shauna's family. Sawyer's her third cousin. They are family. So him saying there's no family left for the funeral is a direct lie. We already, we've already been told that Sawyer is her family. So we can tell just by that lie, we can tell, no, he's not telling the truth. That's, that doesn't add up. And then you also have other clues, um, like when, uh, there was a noise happening outside of their house and, uh, and Sawyer goes to check on it and he's convinced that it's Manny that's like in their backyard hiding and that's the that's the noise. So he leaves food for Manny and what he leaves him is packing peanuts, bubble wrap and mayonnaise packets and he opens the mayonnaise packets and then he comes out the next day and the mayonnaise packets have been scattered as if Manny came and was like eating them. But then he sees that the shed door is open and he's like, oh, it had to be Manny because I always close the shed door because if I don't close the shed door, then raccoons get in there and then they make a mess of everything and scatter it. So he admits that the door is open and when the door's open, raccoons come and scatter things. And then he sees that the door is open and things have been scattered and he attributes it to Manny. So even in the stories that he tells to account for seeing Manny or seeing evidence that Manny is at large, in that, in that account itself, there's an explanation for how, for what really happened, but he ignores that explanation for the sake of the narrative that he's built in his head. 
Also, as a, as an aside, this isn't a clue, but Sawyer's fixation on superhero movies and on making himself the hero of his own story is some kind of disturbing. The murder scenes, specifically the murder scene with Tim, are written in such disturbing language. Really well done by Stephen Graham Jones, my goodness. The depiction of his friends who trust him and who love him and who don't understand what's happening and then the visceral, you know, string around their neck and how slow it happened with Tim and then whenever, when he, when he, um, uh, nails Tim's corpse to the wall to prove that it wasn't a suicide, to prove that he was a, a murder victim. But then he still paints himself as a hero. He, like, as he's killing Tim, he tells him, I love you, I love you, I love you. And then as he's reflecting on it, he's like, that was a slow death, that was a bad death, that was, that was really messy, but I'm learning, I'll do better. My next, my next killing will be, will be smoother. And he's viewing himself as like, I'm the hero here because I'm saving these families. These families, they would all die just like Shauna's family died if I didn't do it. So I have to kill the individual so that the family will be saved. It's simple math. I'm doing them a favor. I'm saving more people by killing just the few. So he's painting himself in this sick way as a hero in the same way that a lot of villains will rationalize the things that they do where it's like, okay, I see how you got there logically, but you're still wrong. You're still doing, you're still committing despicable acts. And that's exactly what Sawyer is doing. And these murder scenes are very, very well done in that way that they're very disturbing, but you also just kind of see how Sawyer has rationalized it all in his head. Then you also see how he vindictively kills Steve when Danielle starts bringing Steve into their group because she's dating him and Sawyer has this very aggressive sort of mentality towards him and Shauna does a really good job at the end of the novella of pointing out the hypocrisy of Sawyer of Sawyer saying I'm killing these people so that there won't be collateral da damage. I'm killing my best friends which sucks and it hurts and I don't like doing it but I'm killing my best friends so their family won't be collateral damage. So it's for the greater good. And then you have Steve, who's Danielle's boyfriend, who's not a part of their friend group, who didn't need to die, who died as, what does Sawyer call him? Collateral damage. He is doing exactly what he pretends that he's saving other people from, from experiencing. He's, he's doing what he's accusing Manny of potentially doing if he doesn't take it into his own hands. And then two, also he actually outright calls himself Manny um, on page 99. After he kills Steve and Danielle, um, it says, in the special report on the news that night, blank face was born. No, I said, sanding the eye holes, sanding the eye holes of my mask larger with my mom's emery board. It's Manny. So Sawyer, has started wearing a mask to make him look like Manny. He's wearing a mannequin mask while he does these killings. And then when they report on Sawyer's killings, he's correcting those reportings by saying, no, it's Manny, even though it's clearly Sawyer doing it. So he's now equated the two. He's now completely conflated himself and Manny. Plus there's two references in this book, one in the beginning of the book and one at the end of it where he uh, refers to Frankenstein. At the beginning he says, I, um, I learned about Frankenstein or I read the book Frankenstein in my AP literature course and I know that when you create something you can't just leave it to run rampant. You have to hunt it down and kill it, which is what Dr. Frankenstein did. And then at the end of the, of the novella, he says, in Frankenstein, you haven't read that yet, have you? They never kill the monster there. I mean, he just ends up way in the Arctic snow islands, floating all around them like he's going to freeze, right? Just sleep, just sleep it out till later. I think that's what Manny's going to do. Just, he'll do it in the lake. So, in the beginning, he said he equates himself with Dr. Frankenstein. He's the one who created the monster. And then at the end, he's explaining why he needs to go hunt down the monster because you don't just leave it run rampant. It, it'll just keep living. So he's equated himself to Dr. Frankenstein. Many readers of the novel Frankenstein will speculate that the true monster of the novel was Dr. Frankenstein, not the monster itself, even though they both committed monstrous acts.
And right after that second Frankenstein reference, he says this, which this was the most telling thing. Look at look at how marked up my, my book is. This is the most telling thing to me. This is the thing that was like, I was already speculating, Jimmy and I were already speculating that Sawyer was doing it all and that he was like, Manny wasn't doing anything. There was no Manny. We were speculating that pretty early on and just trying to find the clues to substantiate our theory. But this was what did it in for me. And it was probably mean to bring him back for just one prank, talking about Manny. If I don't think of that, we're all alive. I mean, we're going to be seniors and graduate and have lives and kids and affairs and everything. Oh, really? Will you? So if you stop, Manny won't continue. If you stop, then you're all going to grow up and have lives and careers and everything. That's why I'm taking it on myself to do what I have to do. Why are you taking it on yourself to do what you have to do? Because if you don't, then they'll grow up. They'll graduate, have kids, affairs, and everything. It's not my fault, exactly, but it sort of is, too, if you look at it, just the one side. Anyway, this is what I was also whispering in my head at the funeral, and what I told myself, JR, had to be whispering the same, right beside me. Anyway, I didn't even really want to live if all my friends were dead. Better to be them, better to be with them, than without them. So... He basically just admitted that if he stops, then it stops. If he doesn't do this, then they all grow up and live lives. But he'd rather do this than be without them because the future he sees is no future with them. The future he sees is them all growing apart. And then the end of the novel, Shauna shows up and she confronts Sawyer. And it's like this big reveal that the whole time Shauna wasn't dead, in fact, the Mack Mac truck didn't kill her. Sawyer, in his mind, rationalize it, rationalizes it as, oh, so when the Mack truck hit the house, she must have been thrown into the woods and she was just surviving in the woods and we all thought she was dead, but actually she was surviving. But the story lets us know that that's not true either. That's just Sawyer being an unreliable narrator again because Shauna says to him, I don't know what you saw, but it wasn't him. Speaking of Manny getting up and walking out the theater. Do you know how I know Sawyer, cousin of mine? Reminding us that they're related. So that thing that Sawyer said about why she didn't have a funeral was a lie. Do you want me to tell you? I fell back away from her, away from this, my hands in the dirt. And I was shaking my head. No, no, I did not need to hear about any mannequins in the lost and found at the movies. I did not need to hear about any mannequins wearing green visors in the break room. I did not need to hear anything remotely like that. Thank you. That's it. There's our answer. He knew, Sawyer knew from the start. He knew that Manny never got up and walked away. He knew that all this time, Manny has been sitting in the lost and found in the break room at the movie theater. He knew it and yet he continued on with this lie. He continued on manufacturing this idea of Manny that it was just miracle grow. It's not that big of a deal. It's just a little lie to make things fall into place, to make things look the way you want them to look. But the whole time it's been Sawyer. The whole time the thing about Shauna was nothing but a lie. The thing about Manny was nothing but a lie. It was actually just Sawyer's fear of his only true family fracturing and leaving him behind. I think it takes some kind of skill to write such a really interesting narrative in 135 pages, but it takes a whole other level of skill to within those 135 pages to write an interesting narrative, but then to write so many layers within that narrative that allow all the clues to be found without ever overtly stating what happened. At no point in this book is it overtly said it was all a lie. It was all in Sawyer's head. He was lying. I, earlier in the, in, in the novella, he uh, also mentions that he um, had been forgetting to take his meds. So that was also an indicator. I forgot to mention that. But never does it overtly say, Sawyer never watched Manny get out of that theater. Never does it overtly say, Sawyer knew the whole time Manny never got up. It was all a lie. But there were so many clues all throughout these 135 pages that at the end of the story, if you were watching, the answer's there. It just wasn't said. And I think that there's some kind of skill 
to write a story like that. So this story of a mannequin that got up and walked out of the movie theater and then our main character who spiraled and started killing off all his friends is fine. It's a good story. It's interesting. Why not? But it's the execution of telling that story that blew me out of the water, that made me completely obsessed with this novella to the point that I've read it twice within a week and I'm probably going to read it again because I'm so impressed with all the little clues that are tucked into these pages that don't feel like clues, they just feel like the narration. But you can tell, you're told very early on, it's signaled to you very early on that Sawyer isn't a reliable sources, source, so you just naturally start looking for the clues and then you find them and then at the end it all falls into place. That's some kind of skill. I'm gonna read more Stephen Graham Jones. I already love mapping the interior, I already plan to read more of his books, but now he's a priority author for me and I'm gonna be reading more real soon. I adored this novella. It blew me out the water. Um, I think that this is one of those stories that very few people will love as much as I loved, but I loved it. What I've got in my pocket now too, it's the ticket stub that Tim couldn't find for the assistant manager that night you came back to us. The ticket isn't for the movie anymore though. All the superhero stuff is over and done with. What I want, what I need now, what I brought the special ticket what I brought the special ticket for. Can you take me with you, please? I think I'm just about I think I'm just about done with everybody here except myself. I want to, if I can, if you'll let me. I just want to go with you and sleep and wait for the next group of kids to find us, the mannequin with the falling apart legs, and the boy mannequin beside him. His face blinked out with pleasure from all the fun that's coming. We'll play all summer long, and it'll never go over. I know. I can't. Not as long as we're together. Not as long as we have each other. I love you, Manny. I never stopped, man. You were the best friend we ever could have had. Sacrifices had to be made. Yeah, but that's all over now. That's all done with. Roll credits, please.